college, it's that first exciting step towards independence, meeting new friends, and starting a career. Freshmen are excited to start this brand new chapter of their lives. They excitedly wave goodbye to their parents, hoping that the next four years will be filled with new adventures, new relationships, and of course, obtaining a degree to propel them forward in life. But for two college freshmen, their lives wouldn't go forward at all. They would be cut short way too soon. And this is their story. Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. If you've never been here before, I'm Kimberlea. Nice to finally meet you. I want to sincerely thank all that checked out my new true crime YouTube podcast channel with my boyfriend, John, and I. We launched it last week, and we are blown away by all of the love and all of the feedback, and we heard the feedback. So I promise the next episode will be better, and we'll just keep getting better from there. If you haven't checked it out, I will link it below, and I will put in the cards and at the end of this video. But today, we are getting into our very first Fall Frightmares case. Also, another one of my college killings series, sadly. Now, let's get into the case for today. The first person that I want to introduce you to is the friendly, fun-loving Eric Franklin Plunkett. Eric was born on September 8, 1981, in Portland, Oregon, and he had an older sister, Erin, who absolutely adored him. His mother, Kathleen Louise McMahon, and father, Craig Melvin Plunkett, first met when they lived out in California. Kathleen had actually just graduated from Grant High School in Van Nuys and went to UCLA, where she majored in public service. Craig attended South Fork High School and went to graduate from the Oregon Polytechnic Institute of Science and Engineering. In 1971, they had an exciting Las Vegas wedding. When they were freshly married and in love, Craig and Kathleen planned to move to Sepulveda, Los Angeles, which is now called North Hills. They were ready to start their careers. However, Life took them in a new direction, and doesn't it do that sometimes? The beautiful, bustling city of Portland, Oregon, where Kathleen and Craig could both dedicate their time to their careers and building a family. Kathleen welcomed a sweet, curly-haired daughter named Erin Louise Plunkett, taking Kathleen's middle name. And then in 1980, Kathleen was overjoyed to find out she was pregnant once again. However, halfway through this pregnancy, Kathleen started to feel very sick, and unfortunately, she was infected with the rubella virus. Rubella is also called the German measles, and it's pretty scary. It can cause anything from mild symptoms like a rash and a low-grade fever to things that are much more dangerous, especially for a pregnant woman. One of those things is an increase of miscarriages, stillbirths, or changes during the baby's development. And of course, that can be very terrifying. I know it's personal, but let me know if you've experienced anything like this. In my last video, I asked a question like this. And I really like reading all of your responses and getting to know more about you. So thank you for being open. And I had no idea about this, but apparently from what I've read, if the fetus gets rubella during the first 12 weeks of pregnancy, the baby will likely be born with many health-related issues, such as deafness, cataracts, heart defects, brain disorders, mental retardation, bone alterations, liver and spleen damage. And that's really terrifying. And if the fetus gets rubella between 12 and 20 weeks of pregnancy, the problems are usually milder, but could still be present. So it's a concerning time for expecting mothers when they get sick like this. In Kathleen's case, she was able to treat her symptoms and her unborn baby appeared to be unharmed. Back in the 80s, prenatal screenings were not that comprehensive as they are today. Back then, the common practice was using an ultrasound to estimate how far along a woman was or just to identify whether there was one baby or multiples. They could also identify any major malformations that they could detect on a scan. These were typically spina bifida or a condition where the baby is missing part of their brain, a heart defect, and cleft palate. I'm telling you all this for a reason. These days, the tests are much more precise. They can detect over 400 genetic conditions. Eric was born on September 8, 1981, and the family was relieved and excited to have a healthy new baby boy. But when Eric was about three months old, Kathleen started to notice something, and she thought it was peculiar, especially already being a mother of Erin and watching her progress through all the early stages of life. She wondered if Eric could have trouble hearing. She realized that he didn't really react to loud noises, and he had some problems with certain motor skills. And it's true that some babies do grow at a different rate, so not every experience will be the same. But since Kathleen was concerned, she took Eric to the doctor. Ultimately, Eric's pediatrician did diagnose him with a mild form 
of cerebral palsy. And this affected his functioning in his legs as well as profound deafness. In case you're not familiar with cerebral palsy, because I've heard of it, but I wasn't too well versed on it. It's known as a developmental disability and it affects the movement and posture and coordination. It's caused by damage or abnormal development in parts of the brain that control movement and it can be mild, moderate, or severe from not needing any assistance at all to requiring leg braces or other medical devices to being in a wheelchair and unable to function on your own. And sadly, there is no cure for it. Eric's case was mild, now profound deafness. That basically means when someone has a total lack of hearing and is not able to detect any sound at all, including human speech. It falls under the umbrella, a very large umbrella, of different types of hearing loss. This would come as a shock to most parents, but there are resources to help. And after the doctor's advice, Kathleen enrolled Eric in infant hearing classes and early childhood education programs. This would help him learn sign language. Eric was also fitted for hearing aids before he turned one year old, and his parents began learning American Sign Language so that they could communicate with their new baby. It's definitely life-changing to bring another human being into this world, but even more so when you have additional challenges like learning a new language. Now, while the entire family learned sign language, Eric's big sister Erin learned it faster than everybody else, and this helped them to develop a very special bond. I know you know this if you've been here, but I care very deeply about the people that I talk about in these videos, and I wanna be able to relate to them as much as I can. I like to know who they were and what they went through in life. That is what drew me to Eric's story. I wanted to understand what it's like to be a deaf person. And by the way, I made sure to look towards individuals from the deaf community before working on this case. And the preferred word to refer to them was either deaf or hard of hearing. Other ways can be offensive. But keep in mind, it's always up to the individual. I'm going to be referring to Eric as deaf. Also, if you know about Anthony Tony Hughes, he was one of Jeffrey Dahmer's victims and he was also deaf. And that left a very big impact for me when I was learning about Tony. But back to Eric now. An interesting thing I learned is that deaf individuals usually get two names, their birth name, like we all have, and then they also get a special name sign that's given to them as they get older and usually assigned by the deaf community. In Eric's case, even though his parents were hearing, they gave Eric a sign for his name. Now it's debated whether that's appropriate for a hearing person to assign a name sign, but as the deaf person gets older, they can decide to change it. It's really supposed to be given by friends, someone that's close to you in the deaf community, and it usually refers to a special trait that that person exhibits. For Eric's parents, they would sign the ASL letter E over their hearts, and that was Eric's special sign name like this. 90% of deaf individuals are born into hearing families, so it's not entirely uncommon for them to be given a name sign by their family. Eric was an incredibly bright and outgoing kid. Kathleen remembers how motivated he was to communicate, and he quickly picked up ASL. Eric always found creative ways to help people understand what he was trying to say. If someone didn't know sign language, he could read their lips or write them notes. Eric also had a very good support system. Kathleen and Craig worked hard to enroll Eric in ASL classes and help him get all the resources he needed in the Portland Public School District. Eric was a big dreamer. He was very independent from a young age. And even though he would have trouble balancing because of his cerebral palsy, if he fell, he would get right back up and try again. This resilience went way beyond the physical struggles he overcame. Any challenge was accepted by Eric with an attitude of perseverance. Once he turned 12, Eric told his parents that he wanted to go to a boarding school in Salem, Oregon, meaning he would be spending five days a week on campus sleeping in a dorm. The boarding school was called OSD, the Oregon School for the Deaf and Eric would still be able to visit his sister and his parents on the weekends. Many deaf individuals can feel like they're an outcast, even in their own home, because they're living with hearing individuals. So being among people like them can be very comforting. Imagine being in a normal public school where no one spoke your language. It's truly hard to feel like you can connect with someone. Kathleen remembers how hard it was to let her baby go off into the world at such a young age, but Eric was thriving and she knew that this would strengthen him as a person. He was a huge social butterfly. He loved being able to connect with other deaf students and just all kinds of people. He also loved being deaf. Whenever Eric went to the mall with his mom, for example, he would tell her, it must be incredibly loud. And he was like, I'm glad I can't hear it. And I love that. Some people are naturally so positive and uplifting, seeing the good in everything that others could possibly see as a negative. Kathleen and Craig's lives were going in separate directions at this time, and they got a divorce in the 90s, 
which was pretty hard on their children. Eric was going through a lot of changes, but he went with the flow, and he was soon blessed with an even bigger family and a bunch of step siblings. In March of 1996, when Eric was 14, his dad married Lois Jean Netherton. Lois had two daughters and a son from a previous marriage, Denise, Lori, and Tim. Whenever Eric wasn't busy with school, he loved spending time with them in Oregon. This is a picture of him with Denise and Lori on his birthday, where they celebrated with a pizza party. While Craig had this new relationship with Lois, Kathleen began dating Christopher Wayne Cornells, a business owner who was a great dad to her kids. But Eric, being so attached to his mother, he definitely had a hard time accepting this new man in their life. Change can be hard. But over time, Eric grew to love Chris and his stepmother, Lois. In 1997, Kathleen got a job offer in Minnesota working for U.S. Bank. Before committing to moving, 15-year-old Eric decided that he was going to travel by himself to Minnesota to see if he liked it. Yes, I can't even imagine. This boy is so brave. He booked train tickets and spent an entire weekend exploring the city by himself. Eric had been bit by the travel bug, and he had been on vacations to Florida, Colorado, and California by this time. Every Christmas, he put plane tickets on his wish list, and I thought that was such a great idea that I've never thought of. I just started traveling this year, and like Eric, I want to go everywhere. He had a lot of places on his list. Winnipeg, Canada, Rome, Italy, and especially New York City, which I love. I love New York. Eric was fearless, passionate, and excited to move somewhere new. With Eric's enthusiasm and approval, Eric, Aaron, Chris, and Kathleen packed up for Burnsville, Minnesota, where Kathleen eventually got married to Chris in February of 1998. And soon Kathleen's life got even busier because she was balancing work and a new pregnancy. The family welcomed Eric's baby sister, Shannon, in August of 1999. While Eric's family grew around him, he flourished at the Minnesota State Academy for the Deaf, another boarding school for deaf high schoolers. The school was a close-knit community of 100 K-12 students, and again, this school helped Eric thrive. Students formed these tight bonds since they were used to growing up with peers who didn't understand their language. The principal even recalled that Eric wanted to study psychology, and he said, quote, Eric thought that he could help others deal with the problems of being deaf in a hearing world because he lived with those problems, and with his personality, he would have been good at it, end quote. Eric took academics very seriously. He had his eyes set on going to college, but not just any college, the number one university for the deaf called Gallaudet University. It's actually the very first school in the world that offered an advanced education for deaf and hard of hearing individuals. All of their programs are specifically designed to cater to the deaf and the hard of hearing students. So Eric had a lifelong dream of getting accepted there one day. He was dedicated to his studies and he continued living at the Minnesota State Academy for the Deaf five days a week in a dorm room and spent the weekends with his family. Eric's high school friends remember him as outgoing, adventurous, and an ambitious student. He was tall and skinny with a huge smile and he loved to box dye his hair by himself. Who didn't growing up? I loved Faria. I think that's what it's called, Faria by L'Oreal. I love the dark red. Eric liked to lighten his hair to a blondish color. In pictures, you can see Eric rocking his bleach blonde and red hair. And another character trait that Eric had was he loved being dramatic. He never let anyone boss him around. One time, Kathleen asked him just to rake the leaves on the weekend, and he laid down in the leaves and was protesting, acting like it was the entire world ending because she'd asked him to do one chore. But even though Eric had the silly side, he was a hard worker and he eventually graduated in May 2000 with honors. He was actually salutatorian of his class. Besides that distinguished honor, Eric also received several awards, the Faribault American Legion Award, the U.S. Bank High School Award, and the American Citizen Award. These awards recognize Eric's academic excellence, his community commitment, and public service dedication. In the spring of 2000, Eric dreamed of nothing more than getting into the one and only school that he applied to, the prestigious Gallaudet University. Gallaudet was and is a prestigious liberal arts college in Washington, D.C. Most of the world's research on deafness is performed at this university campus. The university puts out a ton of resources for people in the deaf community. It's kind of known as the Mecca for deaf students. It's the place to be. And each year, Gallaudet University accepts just a limited number of applicants. It has a very rigorous admissions process and requires applicants to demonstrate high academic excellence and leadership skills. 
I also saw that the university partnered with AT&T to create the first ever accessible helmet for the deaf and hard of hearing quarterbacks. And that's pretty awesome. This helmet allows coaches on the sideline to select a play from a tablet, and then it will send it to a lens that's inside the helmet, and then it will show an augmented reality display in the visor. And that is out of this world. Like technology is advancing at such a fast pace. This helps make sports more inclusive and accessible. Before my research, I had actually been following a deaf influencer, Cheyenne Clearbrook, a deaf influencer on Instagram, but she's more than that. She's a mother, she's an inspiration, and she appeared in the Netflix series, Deaf U. It actually features Gallaudet University, and it provided me so much insight into that culture and what it's like in the deaf community. As I continue to grow as a person, I highly recommend watching shows like Deaf U because it opened my eyes to things I never thought of, like deaf-friendly aspects of everyday life and the lack thereof. They have to think about, for example, how they sit at a table with another deaf person or someone they're signing to. They need to position themselves so they can see one another's hands. Or like when a waiter who's not being conscientious, they just don't know, and they put maybe like a bottle down or something in front of their hands, they just set it down in front of them, blocking their view to the person. And when they're sitting in a group, they sit in a circle so that everybody can see each other's hands. The first episode I watched was of two deaf women getting their nails done, and of course they couldn't communicate with one another because their hands weren't free. I also realized that without subtitles, I wouldn't have been able to understand it because I don't know ASL, and that hit me. It's so important to have subtitles on my videos, and I'm still working on that. I'm trying my best, so I apologize. Sometimes my videos take a little bit longer to process. But most importantly, my videos are about getting to know and understand the people that these stories are about. I want to find out who these people are, what they loved, and how they lived before they died. It's never and should never be just about how they died. So in the early 2000s, Gallaudet had about 2,000 undergraduate and graduate students. The 99-acre campus was actually located in a high-crime neighborhood in Washington, D.C., it's about a 12-minute drive from the U.S. Capitol. It was known as the nation's murder capital, with 482 homicides occurring in 1991. And during the late 1980s and early 1990s, the crack cocaine epidemic resulted in an even more increase in crime. But despite what was going on outside, the college felt like its own little safe island. It was surrounded by a 10-foot-high iron gate with one main entrance to the campus. It was full of cute red brick buildings, bright green lawns, and beautiful statues. When you were inside those gates, it was easy to forget what was happening on the outside. The moment the students drove in, they entered a visually-based paradise. Gallaudet students came from all over the world to study there. Now, I want you to take a moment and think about your college experience, your school experience. The moment you sit down at your desk, and the bell rings, and the intercom goes on. Suddenly, there's morning announcements. They're blasting over the speaker. You're trying to tune out all the information about after-school activities while your friends are telling you all about their weekend. Maybe you'd even stand up and recite the Pledge of Allegiance. And then the teacher looks over and tells you all to stop chatting and get out your textbooks, and your day begins. But now imagine how isolating this might feel if you can't hear the announcements. You can't hear the chit-chat, the whispers behind you, or participate in class the same way as your friends. I told you that 90% of deaf individuals are born into hearing families. They have to learn to speak, read lips, or strain to hear. Not only is it exhausting, but it's just so much harder to feel present and supported in your community, especially when people don't think about accommodations. I can imagine how lonely that would feel. At Gallaudet, it's easier to connect. You can ask for what you need and get your studies done without being exhausted at the end of the day. The campus is built for deaf individuals and even blind students so that everyone starts on a level playing field. When Gallaudet professors enter a classroom, they actually flick a light switch on and off to announce that they just came in. And that's smart. I never thought of that before. Students are always given the option of subtitles, note-taking services, interpretation, and extended exam times. In the 2000s, students attached two-way pagers to their belt loops, and they would vibrate with messages instead of ringing like cell phones. I've even learned a lot about the iPhone and its accessibility mode, and if you have never seen the way it can flash when a text comes in or a call comes in, even in different patterns for different contexts in your phone, it's brilliant. Gallaudet is a truly magical place. 
Everywhere you look on campus, people are doing activities. They're having these animated conversations. And for Eric, it was his dream. He applied knowing it was the only school he wanted to go, and he eagerly awaited his acceptance letter. Kathleen ended up opening it. While he was at boarding school, she wanted to save him the disappointment just in case it was a rejection. When she found out that he got an accepted, though, she could not wait to tell him. Kathleen and Chris drove out to meet Eric at the school lobby, holding his acceptance letter and a bunch of balloons. And Eric screamed. He jumped up and down with excitement. And it was a magical moment for him. And I can imagine that excitement. He had his acceptance letter framed. That's how much it meant to him to get into Gallaudet. He proudly promised his mom that in four years, he would put his diploma on top of that acceptance letter the moment he graduated college so that he would have his proudest moments in one place. Eric spent that summer excitedly getting ready for the best four years of his life. And in August before he left for school, Eric bought his older sister Erin a nice camera so they could keep in touch over the internet. It was gonna be hard being away from his family. He had to say goodbye to everyone, especially his little sister Shannon, who was only about one when he embarked on this long trip from Minnesota to Washington, D.C. with Kathleen, Chris, and his gigantic collection of movies, which eventually would make him very popular on campus. You remember VHS? That's what he had. On a beautiful sunny fall day, 18-year-old Eric moved into Cogswell Hall along with 150 other freshman students. It was a four-story residence hall on the far west side of Gallaudet's campus, and there was a twin building right next door to it called Krogh Hall. Rooms are furnished with beds, dressers, desks, chairs, and closets. There was also a television and a study lounge available on each floor. Eric moved his bags into room 101, a single dorm in the men's wing. He decorated the walls with pictures of his family and his little sister, Shannon, and took final pictures with Kathleen to add to that collection. When she finally had to say goodbye, she felt all the emotions. She was watching her baby boy go off to college. She kept turning around and looking at Eric as she walked away. She was overjoyed and overwhelmed. Each time she turned around, Eric would sign, don't worry about me, I'll be all right. This was the last thing he would ever sign to her in person. We all take in these special moments, but we never think they're gonna be as significant as they can be sometimes, especially when it's for the worst reasons. But at the time, Eric was thrilled to start classes. He wasted no time jumping into his studies and getting involved in extracurricular activities. He wanted to be a psychiatrist. Even though he was living in a single room, he always had his door open so that other students at Cogswell Hall could walk in and just hang out. He would even let people borrow whatever they wanted from his music and movie collection. He even shared items from his care packages that his mom sent from home. And here is one of those big boxes with ramen in it. His generosity made him very popular with people in his dorm. No one was a stranger to Eric. He would walk up and introduce himself to anyone and everyone. He loved showing off pictures of his family, especially his little sister. And every time he got a new picture sent to him, he would wave his friends down and tell them, come see, come see. He just sounds like such a genuinely kind person. College can also be some students' first time away from home. Now, Eric had some experience because he went to boarding schools, but to help ease them into this new environment, the dorm has residence assistants who act as a resource and even as a friend to new students. They also make sure that the rules and regulations are being followed. Now, Cogswell Hall had a female and a male RA for each floor. On the first floor where Eric was, they had two RAs, Lauren Buco and Thomas Koch. And they acted like a stand-in big brother and sister to the group of new freshmen. Now, the residents of Cogswell Hall were fun. They were a rowdy group from all across the nation and even the globe. Eric fit right in. Now, Cogswell Hall was pretty secluded. Students like to call it the Wild Wild West because of its isolation from the other dorm rooms and because it was on the west side of campus. This was a good thing. It meant that the students in this hall formed very close friendships. On September 8th, Eric celebrated his 19th birthday with his new college friends. His closest friend was Thomas Minch. Thomas was a theater kid. He lived in a different residence hall, Krug Hall nearby, but the two of them shared several classes together. Thomas was a native of New Hampshire. He loved the outdoors, and he was saving money for a new Ford Explorer. Now, Eric thought Thomas was so funny and so cool that he introduced him to his Wild Wild West group. Eric also spent a lot of time hanging out at the Abbey, the closest campus cafe, and he usually ate lunch with a couple of other new friends. 
Benjamin Varner, a quiet student who lived on the first floor of Cogswell Hall with him, and Joseph Mesa Jr., who also lived on the first floor in room 102, directly across from Eric's room. I'm doing this because I think it's important to talk a little bit about the people who eventually made up Eric's close circle of friends. They're all very interesting, and they're all part of his story. Benjamin, who was also known as Ben, was 19 years old. He was born in San Antonio, Texas, and although he was shy and he had kind of a withdrawn personality, he was very kind and he was an extremely intelligent person. He was the complete opposite of Eric when it came to socializing. He would rather go straight to his room and read. He had a 4.0 GPA, and his hobbies were reading, writing, and learning about the world. So, you know, Eric has some very interesting friends, and now 20-year-old Joseph was originally from Guam, and he showed his love for his homeland. He had a giant flag over his bed. He came to Gallaudet University with his girlfriend, Melanie de Guzman, and they planned to get married after they graduated, and everyone could tell how much they were in love. Before Joseph moved to the United States, he worked as a youth counselor. He was known for his generous nature. He would buy gifts for his friends or lend them money when they needed it. Joseph also tutored students in math, including Eric. Joseph, Eric, Ben, and Thomas had gone to know each other for the weeks that they had been there, and they became close pretty quickly. The four boys hung out on that first floor every day where they could watch TV and just chill. Eric was also enjoying the extracurricular activities which included exploring his romantic life. Eric was gay, but he had not come out to everyone in his family. However, he was proudly out on campus. This always takes courage, but it would have taken a lot of courage at the time since it was very hard to be gay in the early 2000s. That year, Gallaudet actually had many reports of homophobic threats. There were graffiti slurs on dorm room doors and there were hate crimes happening around campus. So much so, people were afraid to walk alone at night. Eric's RA, Lauren, said that the violence on campus didn't seem to bother Eric, but it did exist. But we know that Eric looks at the positive side of things. He's always been proud of who he is. In mid-September, Eric actually ran for secretary of the Lambda Society. Now, this is a student club for LGBTQ students, and he won. And he was proud of his accomplishment and his involvement in the Lambda Society. If Eric was bullied or he ever experienced hate crimes towards him, no one would know about it because he never said anything. Since Eric was a secretary of the Lambda Society, he was predominantly involved in the society's day-to-day -day activities, and he worked hard to ensure that the society members were protected and supported. So despite the rampant hatred and prejudice they faced, he wanted to make sure that they felt safe. During his time at Gallaudet, Eric loved to video call Aaron over his computer, and their setup was very similar to FaceTime, for example. From Aaron's point of view, she could see all of Eric's dorm room with pictures of the family and everything taped to the walls, and he could see everything that was going on at their house. So on September 26, Aaron was doing her weekly phone call with Eric when something caught her eye. There was a guy that just walked through Eric's door, and then he just took something from right behind him. So, of course, she asked Eric, do you know that someone just came right in without knocking? And he's like, yeah, people come in and borrow movies all the time. Remember, he has an open-door policy. But to those not familiar with how dorm life kind of works at Gallaudet, Aaron thought it was strange that someone would just walk in without announcing their presence. I was actually thinking about how Eric wouldn't be able to hear anyone come in. That scares me because I jump at the littlest noise. As a hearing person, I'd be able to hear even, you know, tiny footsteps, let's say. But think about not having one extra sign that someone's behind you. Occasionally, people who are deaf will scream or they'll holler because when someone does shout like that, like in a hallway, for example, or a closed space, the wall echoes and vibrates and you can feel those vibrations. So even knocking would send vibrations alerting you that someone is present. On this call, Erin offered to put Kathleen on video to talk to Eric, and even though she was very busy with the work project, she took a minute to stop and say hello to her son. She remembers waving goodbye and saying that she would talk to him later. That would be the last time that she saw her son. On the evening of Thursday, September 28th, Gallaudet students were in Cogswell Hall finishing up some last-minute studying, leaving theater practice, and getting ready to watch TV in their pajamas. Lauren was the first floor RA on duty. She did some studying in her room and was just waiting for the hour to hit so she could make her rounds. That's when she was visited by one of Eric's friends, Joseph. He signed to her that he was concerned about Eric because usually he tutored him around 8 p.m. on Thursdays, but Eric hadn't shown up for his session. And this wouldn't normally freak him out, but Eric's door that was usually opened was closed and locked, which never happened. He also said he noticed a very weird smell 
coming from Eric's room. Oh my God, yeah, that would definitely be a cause for concern. So Lauren thought that this was really strange too. Eric was, as I said, very social. He never missed hanging out with his friends and he wouldn't have missed an academic tutoring session. But she did wonder what the smell could be. Was it marijuana? Was it alcohol? Maybe incense? But Joseph was like, no, 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 it's none of those things. So she went to find the male RA, Thomas Koch, because she didn't feel comfortable walking into Eric's dorm herself. Once she met up with Thomas, they went to Eric's room together. They knocked on his door, hoping the vibrations would get his attention. But when he didn't open, Thomas used the master key to unlock that door. And then he flicked the light switch on and off to announce himself. Lauren was standing right next to Thomas when he opened that door. And the first thing she saw was a large amount of blood on the carpet. It was not something you would miss. And from that pool, there was a trail that led to a body that was collapsed in the middle of the room. It appeared to her like Eric had fallen and hit his head, causing a lot of blood loss. We're aware, and so is everyone else, that Eric had cerebral palsy, and he was susceptible to losing his balance and falling. And that was the first thought that Lauren had. He'd fallen, and he'd been seriously injured, or maybe he was drunk and he vomited, or he fell because of intoxication. Thomas actually couldn't even understand what he was looking at. His mind saw blood, but in his heightened state of shock, he had never seen anything like this before, he didn't connect that the blood actually belonged to Eric. Horrified, Thomas slams the door and tells Lauren they need to call the campus police. When EMTs arrived on the scene, they broke the news that Eric was deceased, and it wasn't from natural causes. It was clear that Eric had been murdered. Washington Metro Police were called on the scene and they quickly evacuated all students and personnel from Cogswell Hall. Then they cordoned off the entire building. This was now a homicide investigation and nothing like this had ever happened at Gallaudet before. We do know that right outside the college, it's known for a high crime rate, but for this to happen on campus was beyond the normal shock that any murder would have brought. As investigators arrived and examined Eric's thin body on the floor, they noted that he was lying face down in a large pool of blood near his head. He also appeared to have a broken neck and they recovered a broken pair of eyeglasses next to his body. They also found a clump of Eric's scalp with hair still attached and blood spatter all over a chair in his room. After examining this chair, it was determined that it may have been used by the killer to repeatedly strike Eric in the head and the lower back. That was where most of his injuries could be seen. Now, primarily, it appeared to investigators that Eric had died as a result of blunt force trauma. Something else was evident. This was overkill. Much, much more force was exerted than was necessary to end Eric's life. After doing this initial walkthrough and collecting photo and video evidence, Eric was transported to DC General Hospital, where a medical examiner would conduct the autopsy. Now back in Burnsville, Minnesota. Kathleen and Chris are just finishing dinner, and they hear the phone and the doorbell ring at the same time. Eric's stepdad, Chris, answers the phone. He's confused, and someone on the other line tells him, please open the front door for the police. Chris's heart dropped. He and Kathleen opened the door and were met with two uniformed officers as well as a chaplain. That's not a good sign. They asked if it was the home of Eric Franklin Plunkett, and that is when Kathleen and Chris both had this overwhelming feeling that something horrible had happened. And of course, they were right. Once this horrific news was delivered, Kathleen sobbed uncontrollably. Chris remembers her saying over and over again, I took my baby to college and he's never coming home. She just kept repeating that. It was unbelievable. How horrible would it be to say goodbye to your only son as he goes off to college and find out a month later he's dead? He had taken a big risk. He was leaving home to pursue his passion for learning. But it's a risk that many teenagers take. Parents shouldn't be worried that they're going to end up dead. And now Eric would never be able to proudly place his diploma over that acceptance letter. He'd never start a career. He'd never have a family of his own or travel the world. Kathleen would never get to hug him again. And that's heartbreaking. When Eric's father, Craig, and his stepmom, Lois, got the news, they were equally devastated. Craig was inconsolable. Meanwhile, Kathleen, Chris, and Aaron took the very first flight they could get from Minnesota to Washington, D.C. The plane was so empty at the time that everyone decided to spread out and sit separately from one another 
Aaron said that you would think in this moment, the family would want to be close, but they needed time and space alone to process what had just happened. They were all desperate for answers. They didn't know what was happening. And I can understand both. I think there are definitely times for grieving people to come together, but I think we know that everyone grieves differently and sometimes you just want to be alone in silence. The very next day on Friday, Eric's family got to DC and immediately went to Gallaudet to find out what happened to Eric. His dorm room was taped off from the public and police were still conducting their investigation and documenting all of the evidence. So far, they'd only determined three things. First, there was no sign of forced entry, which is no surprise because Eric always had his door unlocked. And September 28th would have been no different. Second, there had been a struggle. And third, his computer was still on with a bunch of screens open. Tragically, as they were searching, they found no fingerprints or DNA evidence on the scene. There was nothing the police could process and use to determine who the killer was right away. Aaron, Kathleen, and Chris went to talk to the police to get solid answers to find out who killed Eric, but instead, they realized they just walked into an interview. Detective Kyle Simioidi, who had been put in charge of the case, began asking them a bunch of questions right away, and I know why this could seem very insensitive, and I'll go as far as saying it is insensitive, but it's also imperative for police to get as much information as they can about the victim as fast as they can so they can provide those answers to grieving families. But that doesn't mean it makes this process any easier. Detective Simioidi wants to know who Eric was, who he was friends with, what his lifestyle was like, how often did he use his computer, why was there a digital camera attached to it. And Chris and Kathleen were left speechless. They were shocked that these police officers didn't even have any leads past just a logged-in computer. But the case was still fresh. There was not much information for the detectives to share. But the family hadn't prepared for anything like this. Kathleen said that Eric had sent him an email the day after that FaceTime call with Aaron. So that would have been September 27th. All it was was an update from him like usual. She did email him back and she never heard anything. She didn't think anything of it at the time because Eric was always busy studying. He was doing student organizations and hanging out with his friends because he was an overachiever. And he had been telling her he was doing so well, so it did not raise any suspicion at the time. Investigators are trying to narrow down his time of death. And that's when the police eventually asked Kathleen to come to the morgue and identify her son's body. She wanted to be brave for her son and for everybody else and her family, but she made it to the door and she couldn't go inside. And that made me tear up when I read it. That's her baby. So her husband, Chris, he's trying to be as supportive as possible for his wife. He decides that he's gonna go in and he did confirm that Eric was the person that had been killed. It was the hardest thing he had ever done in his life. I don't think many things could come close to that. At Gallaudet, students would normally be finishing up with class and getting excited to hang out over the weekend, but not that day. Students woke up on Friday to find all their classes were canceled, and there was a lockdown at Cogswell Hall. The students were evacuated from the rooms and they could not go back inside to retrieve anything, not their books, their clothing, even their toothbrushes, and they were virtually homeless. They had to find a place to stay, like in their friends' dorm rooms, until further notice. There wasn't exactly a protocol for this. Rumors were also swirling about what happened, but soon, everyone was notified. One of the most extroverted, enthusiastic freshmen had been murdered in his dorm room. To say that it shocked the campus would literally be an understatement because no one could believe this could ever happen, especially to someone like Eric. Why? Everyone liked him, and how? The campus had security measures. Had somebody snuck into campus? Had they stolen a key card? And then just walk through Eric's open door? If so, was he targeted? Or was this some kind of crime of opportunity and his door just happened to be the one that was open? Even worse, was the perpetrator a part of their community? Was it another student? Or was it a hate crime? What kind of person would be capable of something so savage? And what would their motive be? And what if it happened again? All of these unanswered questions kept the students up at night. Imagine you're living on this island, you're in a protective oasis in this college, and then a friend or a classmate is murdered out of nowhere for no apparent reason. Now students are fearful that they could be next. They kept imagining getting caught off guard with no time to protect themselves as their key was turning in their lock. There's no calling for help. There's no person next door overhearing the struggle because they can't, and that's terrifying. Gallaudet University provided crisis counselors for the students so they could talk about their fears. But for many people, 
It was a matter of life or death, and they had to decide whether they wanted to take that risk and stay on campus, and many of them left. Meanwhile, there were theories that began to circulate, with the biggest one being whether Eric had been a victim of a hate crime. It would line up with the other hate crimes that had already happened on campus. So what if someone was targeting queer people? The Lambda Society asked police to take a deeper look into Eric's death as a hate crime, especially since he was openly gay. Now, I've got to mention that I met such a compassionate podcaster at an event that I was at. Her name is Mallory Jenna Robinson. She is an Afro-Caribbean transgender woman and a community leader and the creator of the true crime and investigative journalism podcast called A Hateful Homicide. It is dedicated to covering hate crimes, especially against the transgender members in the United States and abroad. So I will link her podcast below because hate crimes are sadly going up in our country. And in Eric's case, it was the most obvious theory being looked into as the reason for his murder. The Washington Metropolitan PD, and I'm going to just abbreviate it as the MPD, they set up headquarters at Gallaudet so they could pin down a culprit. They called it the Department of Safety and Security. And after interviewing Eric's family, Detective Simioidi began interviewing everyone who knew Eric, his friends, his professors, people he interacted with on a daily basis, and any Cogswell Hall students that had access to his room, which was pretty much everyone on all four floors. During these interviews, many people said that Eric was gay, and he might have been murdered for that reason. That was a reoccurring theme, as I said. But Detective Simioidi thought that Eric's injuries seemed, quote, too personal to be a hate crime, end quote. Whatever that's supposed to mean. The amount of blood on the floor, the way he had been bludgeoned, it made it look like his death was motivated by rage or revenge, which I was confused about because isn't that what would also be the motive for a hate crime? But he was a professional, so this is what his point of view was. Because this campus was so secure, in students' opinions anyway, they began to suspect each other. They didn't know who to trust. The campus started to look like a ghost town. But after a long day of interviews and grieving, the students, as well as Eric's family, met right outside his first floor window on Friday night. They held a candlelight vigil, and they had framed pictures of Eric, they had pink carnations, and a huge poster board for everyone to sign. A few of the students stood up and they talked about Eric, including Thomas Minch, who had spent all day working on Eric's online memorial site. At the end of the vigil, everyone stood in line to sign this poster and write notes to Eric and his family. Chris, Eric's stepdad, remembers how surreal this experience was. Kathleen was seen writing a note to her son. And when he was watching her, trying to hold herself together, and say goodbye to her baby boy, it was too much. His knees actually gave out. Two goodbyes within one month, and one of those goodbyes turned out to be forever. She wrote, quote, Eric, my only son, you are my pride and joy, and I will always love you. You will always live on in my heart. Please watch over us. All my love forever, mom, end quote. Erin also felt like she needed to sign the poster as well, and she wrote, quote, My only brother, I'm sorry I didn't get to talk to you more. I can't wait to see you in heaven. Take care of mom and dad, end quote. Then the students came and they hugged this family. Kathleen got hugs from Eric's Wild Wild West crew, Ben, Thomas, and Joseph, and they had compassion for his parents. They sympathized with them. Kathleen was so proud that even though her son had only been at Gallaudet University for a brief time, He had made a difference. He had a profound impact on his classmates and several even commented about how he embodied the school's spirit and taught students and staff members many lessons with his cheerful personality and his smile. Eric's RA, Lauren, she couldn't help but feel a sense of guilt considering she was the one who found him and she was supposed to keep students safe. She felt like she'd failed him. And that would be tough. That sense of guilt is natural but this isn't her fault. Then without any answers from the police, Chris, Kathleen, and Aaron, they returned home to start preparing for Eric's funeral. You never think you're gonna do that as a parent. Meanwhile, over the next couple days, Detective Simioidi continued the slow process of interviewing every student. Now, detectives are highly trained to rely on tone of voice, word choices, and watching someone's demeanor, their mannerisms, things like that. But that's when you're interviewing someone in the hearing world. Since all of these interviews were with deaf individuals, 
This interview process took so much longer. The police had to ask more questions than usual. They had to have interpreters there. And they were trying their best to fully capture exactly what was being said. And that's really tough. Things can get lost in translation. Again, not something that I've ever thought about. The autopsy results were finally in, and the report revealed that Eric had been strangled and then hit repeatedly in the head. His cause of death was blunt force trauma to the head and a broken neck. The manner of death was, of course, homicide. With the savage and intense nature of his wounds, it was speculated to be a crime of passion. Detectives believed they needed to take a deeper look into Eric's personal life to solve this murder. The medical examiner estimated that Eric's time of death had been between possibly when he was found at 8 p.m. on Thursday the 28th up to two or three days earlier. So now they had to kind of do the math, connect the dots. And luckily, a lot of people were coming forward. Thomas, the RA, wanted to help any way that he could. He even provided the investigators with a detailed drawing of the entire building so they could help ascertain different entry points, for example. Friends and classmates were asked when the last time they saw Eric was. They knew that Eric had apparently sent that email to his mom on Wednesday, so police wondered if anyone had contact with him after that. And it turns out, Eric had missed all of his classes and been absent from every meal the entire day on Thursday. So now the time of death is narrowed down to sometime between the afternoon of Wednesday 27th and the afternoon of the 28th. But since he didn't go to school all day or even eat any meals, they thought it probably happened on the night of the 27th, but they couldn't be sure. Oh, and it was also rumored that Eric was in a romantic relationship with a guy named Thomas. But as far as the last name was concerned, no one had solid information to provide them. Well, we know of two Thomases, Thomas Minch, who is one of Eric's friends, and Thomas Koch, which was the RA. Each person that was close to Eric was being interviewed in depth. And when they spoke to Joseph, which was Eric's friend that lived right across from him, he was a member of the Wild Wild West group, he told them that they might be interested to know that Thomas Minch and Eric had argued before his murder. And he said that there were rumors they were more than friends. Aha, okay, that's one of the Thomases, the quiet one. So now the investigators are eager to bring him in. But while waiting to speak to Thomas Minch, the Lambda Society president, yet another Thomas, he's Thomas Green, he described concerns that other LGBTQ plus students had at this university, and he told this to the Washington Post. It was kind of a big deal. It was in the news. Although the police were not investigating Eric's murder as a hate crime, the group's president urged them to do so. In an interview with the newspaper on October 3rd, Thomas Green said that several gay students had been harassed in the days leading up to Eric's death. There were several anti-gay slurs that were painted on memo boards outside of the dorm rooms. That's not all. There were offensive remarks that were actually made to gay students as well. According to this article, an interview with Thomas Green, he said he was waiting for the latest news on his friend being murdered. He was on campus in the plaza right after they discovered Eric's body. Thomas said that his friend watched a student standing nearby sign, quote, oh good, one less gay, end quote. When he turned around, he saw the other people that were standing around smiling and gesturing in approval of that statement. After Eric's murder, a faculty member actually taught a self-defense class for the Lambda Society members for that reason, because they were so convinced that there was a connection there. They even had the Lambda Society create a buddy system so that members were never alone on campus. However, the Gallaudet president of the student government, he stated that the problems on campus were just like all the other ones across all universities. He said, quote, to say that this is a problem, I don't know if that's fair to say. We don't know what there is to be afraid of. And he was basically saying that this is no different than any of the problems on any other university. It can be seen as invalidating real people's feelings and experiences. But I also think this could be damage control. When a murder happens on campus, you lose students. If they don't think this is a safe environment, they're gonna leave in droves. Eric's funeral was held on October 3rd in Burnsville, Minnesota. And while Chris and Kathleen were getting ready to lay their son to rest, they received a call from Detective Simioidi. Now, you're probably not going to believe this, but bear with me. The police had actually made an arrest. They had the killer behind bars. All they needed to do was match it up with all the evidence they had. That was fast. But it turned out that earlier that same day, on Tuesday, October 3rd, five days after Eric's body had been found, detectives went up to Thomas Minch in the school cafeteria, and they asked him if he could come in for an interview. 
They had two interpreters sit down with Thomas, which is Eric's quiet friend, that 18-year-old freshman from New Hampshire. He came from a deaf family. He, his brother, his parents, and his five cousins were deaf. And growing up, this family was widely known and respected in the New Hampshire area. Thomas earned a reputation as high achieving and hardworking. And now he'd been rumored to be involved with Eric romantically and had argued with him before his death. Something we hadn't heard was that he apparently had a short fuse and a very bad temper. During over a hundred interviews, detectives had gathered that Thomas and Eric had a toxic romantic relationship and had gotten in a few public fights. Well, as you know, I've covered a lot of murders and domestic issues come up again and again as motives. In the detective's eyes, this was a promising lead. They sat down with Thomas and two Gallaudet interpreters, and this interview took almost six hours. I told you it takes a lot longer for these detectives to do this when they're working with interpreters. When Thomas came in, he was visibly nervous. He was shaking, he was covering his face, and he started off by signing that he and Eric, yeah, they were really good friends, but they were not super close like best friends, but they had hung out regularly since they moved to DC. But he stated that he had not had any sexual relations and they were not in a romantic relationship. He insisted that he was not gay. He was pounding his fists on the table to illustrate how frustrated he was that people thought he was gay. The detectives asked Thomas where he'd been on Thursday night, and he said he was at rehearsal for theater. He was there all evening. He was the assistant stage manager. However, he got off just before 8 p.m., leaving a tiny window of time where he could have slipped away and killed Eric. Thomas said he remembered walking home from practice, but interestingly, he couldn't recall what he did for the rest of the evening. After some more questioning about the nature of their relationship, Thomas denied ever having a relationship more than friends with Eric, even though many students had come forward and confirmed that they had at least one sexual encounter and detectives thought there was a motive in there somewhere. They were sure of it, so they doubled down. Thomas eventually admitted that he had experimented with Eric once, but he said he immediately regretted it, and all they did was touch. That Thomas was lying, at least partially. He had been told by someone he interviewed that Eric was seen on Wednesday night being pushed into his dorm floor by Thomas. All Detective Simioidi needed was to get a confession from Thomas and they could get all the evidence to back it up. Then they'd have their murderer and the rest of the students could feel safe again in their beds. And that's when Thomas finally came clean. He said that Eric invited him over to hang out with him in his room. Then he made a romantic move on him and Thomas signed that he would rather not do anything because he considered Eric to be a really good friend and just a friend. Allegedly, Eric tried again. Thomas said he was feeling like he wasn't respecting his boundaries, so he pushed Eric. That's when he stumbled back, but he said he didn't hit the floor, and Thomas just ran out of the room. But according to him, this happened one or two weeks before Eric's murder, and he hadn't seen him since. But the detective wasn't buying it. He believed it happened Wednesday the 27th, when witnesses said they saw both of them together. But according to Thomas, Simioidi said if he didn't confess to the crime, he would put him in jail for the rest of his life, and everyone would think he was gay. But according to Detective Simioidi, he said, no, we said the Lord's Prayer together. And then five hours into the interview, Thomas said, I did it, and actually confessed to killing Eric. So what was the truth? Well, Thomas was arrested at 5.30 p.m. and spent the rest of the night in jail. Meanwhile, the detectives were celebrating with champagne because they caught their killer. But you know there's going to be more because the video is not over yet. When Kathleen got the call that Thomas was in jail, she was relieved, she was outraged, she was upset, she had all these feelings going through her. But they hoped that this meant that they were gonna find out why Eric was killed. A confession is a confession, right? And now all they have to do is get that evidence to confirm it. Well, that's not what the US attorney felt like. Cause the next day, when Detective Simoidi tried to file the actual charges against Thomas, the attorney refused. He didn't believe that there was enough evidence to show that Thomas confessed to killing Eric. He had only admitted to rejecting advances. And when the interpreters were questioned, they came forward explaining that they may have misunderstood or misinterpreted Thomas's words. It was a mess. Thomas also came forward and said he was exhausted at the time, and he was telling the detectives what he wanted to hear so he could be let go. So the DC police, they had to release Thomas for a lack of evidence. And even worse, they had to call Kathleen and tell her that the charges were dropped. 
Of course, the family was outraged. The police had just let their son's murderer go. And this is a great example of how investigations can be so frustrating and you can't jump to any conclusions and you gotta do things right. But Thomas had a motive and a confession. His use of force against Eric was a huge cause for concern. But there just wasn't any forensic evidence to keep him in jail at that point. Because the police had to keep in mind, they can be sued for unlawful arrest without enough evidence, probable cause, that whole thing. But Detective Samuidi vowed to keep investigating and prove that Thomas was the killer. I mean, Thomas should not have hit or pushed Eric. That is not okay. But if Eric was truly crossing Thomas's boundaries and he wanted to break free, so to speak, would that be out of line? And would that be a motive for murdering Eric? Or was he just trying to backpedal and use misinterpretation as an excuse? There were also questions about whether you can trust a confession after a six hour interview. We've heard this before. And whether it's okay to arrest someone on just a confession alone when you haven't gotten that evidence, like which comes first? Especially when this confession is made through interpreters. English is hard enough as it is, but translating ASL to English, something can definitely get lost there. It seemed like both the detectives and Thomas Minch were dishonest with one another. They both did things that were questionable. But if Thomas is guilty, they should be able to prove it even without a confession. So that's what they sought to do. At this point, about half of the Gallaudet community thought that Thomas was responsible. He had received anonymous threats saying that if he didn't leave campus, he would be beaten or killed. The other half, including most of the freshman class, could not believe Thomas did it because they knew him. Why would a nice guy like him murder one of his closest friends? Were they in a relationship? Was Thomas even gay? Also, many of the students believed a deaf student would not kill another deaf student. That was their belief system. With all of these polarizing opinions on Thomas, the university felt like they had no other choice but to expel him, both for Thomas's safety and the safety of the school. Thomas picked up and he moved back to New Hampshire. Many of his former friends then came forward after he left Washington, D.C., and they told investigators that Thomas had a bad temper. One person said that he threw a trash can across the room when he got mad about something. Yeah, he had to go. They didn't want to take another risk and have another murder happen on their once safe campus. The school took steps. They installed more security cameras. They had more security guards patrolling the area. And after the dumpster fire of the arrest, the confession, the things have gone wrong, Detective Samuidi was asked to step down from the case. And now Detective James LaFranchise took over, but the case had gotten a little cold with no new leads. However, 30 days after Eric was killed, the investigation picked up once again. There was a search warrant granted that gave them access to unlock Eric's computer. Now they could check Eric's AOL, his disks, and all his accounts. And they found some transactions showing that someone had used Eric's accounts to purchase bikes. And they couldn't figure out who had done this. Was it Eric or someone else? Also, when Kathleen received Eric's bank statements in the mail, she looked through them and she realized that there were debit card charges from Thursday morning. This was the day he was found dead. It looked like Eric had actually been shopping at various stores in Union Station. There were at least 10 different transactions made. So remember how Eric wasn't seen on Thursday? He didn't go to classes. He didn't eat at the cafeteria. Was it because he was shopping or was he already dead and someone else was using his card? Those are good questions. So the new detectives figure there's an easy way to find out. They go to Union Station and check the footage. They could find out exactly who was using Eric's card. But when they got there, they found out that Union Station automatically erased all of their camera footage 30 days after it's recorded. And guess what? It had been 31 days since Eric's murder. I, I can't believe it, but I can believe it. I swear. I don't know who decides that footage has to be erased after 30 days. I don't know if there's a way to like check the recently deleted folder, but I guess not. And especially because it was the early 2000s. The detectives are frustrated. They head back to headquarters and they had to send updates to Eric's family. They're not going to be able to tell who made the transactions. As October and November dragged on, Gallaudet students continue to wonder if the killer was Thomas, or was it someone else on campus or someone on the outside? A few more students had dropped out or withdrawn from the school altogether. The first floor of Cogswell Hall was now considered the danger zone and it was abandoned. All the students that lived down there were moved up to the fourth floor instead. The police gave Gallaudet students constant reassurance that they would be safe before they left for the holiday season. Even though the students were scared, 
they were reassured countless times that the murderer would be found. Thanksgiving and Christmas came around, which was what everyone needed. A break, to feel safe in their own homes, to be surrounded by their support systems. People left campus and spent the rest of the winter decompressing. And when students came back on campus, their spirits were lifted. Just being home was enough to make them feel confident again and ready for another semester of learning. It was January 2001. The spring semester was about to start and it had been five months since Eric's murder. Thomas Minch was still their main suspect and forensic evidence finally came back. And guess what? Police found some light brown hairs at the crime scene and they weren't Eric's. And guess who had light brown hair? Thomas. But it turns out they weren't Thomas's either. And I can't help but think uh, so many people went in and out in this college. How are you going to find out who that is? But somehow, this new evidence caused detectives to say that they could pretty much remove Thomas Minch from suspicion. But that's not what the Washington, D.C. grand jury thought. They convened, and Thomas Minch was forced to return to the state. He had to provide a handwriting sample to the grand jury. They wanted to know, did he sign for any of those transactions on Eric's bank account? Investigators hoped that Thomas's handwriting would match the signature on Eric's bank receipt. Before this hearing took place, many students came back from break and a few were moved from Cogswell to other dorms because they wanted to feel safer. But not everyone could be accommodated in that way. And unfortunately for one student, that would have been the difference between life and death. Thomas Minch flew in from New Hampshire with his parents on February 1st, 2001. The hearing was scheduled and he was gonna testify that he never confessed to murdering Eric that he never would murder Eric. Eric's family and at least a dozen members of the student body watched as Thomas testified in front of the DC grand jury. The main thing the jury wanted from Thomas was proof that he forged the signature of Eric Plunkett. So in front of this jury, Thomas signed Eric's name. When the two samples were compared, guess what? The jury found inconclusive results. The signatures were not the same, but not different enough to release Thomas from suspicion. And this is even despite the evidence of the hair that wasn't his on the scene. Now Thomas, his family, Eric's family, they could all go back home. But I'm sitting here thinking, if you're being accused of murder and they're basing it on whether you forged a signature and let's say you're guilty, wouldn't you just do the signature wrong on purpose? Like That does not seem like viable evidence to me. It doesn't seem like a good way to rule someone out. And no one knew it yet, but another student was about to suffer the same fate as Eric Plunkett. In the early morning hours of February 3rd, the night after Thomas testified, horror struck the Gallaudet campus. At 4.15 a.m., someone in Cogswell Hall pulled the fire alarm. RAs Lauren and Thomas were not sure why the alarm had been pulled because there didn't seem to be a fire or smoke anywhere. But they did their duty and evacuated all the students from their rooms. They started on the second and third floors, checking to see if the students had all gathered outside in the cold. Then on the fourth floor, that's when Thomas came running down the hall towards Lauren. His face was pale, he was shaking, and he signed while screaming, it happened again. Lauren thought he was joking at first, because denial seems to be that first stage of grief. She just stood there and shook her head, but Thomas led her down the hall, and together they entered Eric's friend Ben's single room, and it was true. And it was so much worse than Eric's crime scene. What happened to Ben was horrific. This appeared to be an intense fight, with Ben trying desperately to get away from his assailant. Ben was bigger than Eric, and he had way more mobility. So despite not being able to call for help, he had done his best to survive. That was apparent. There was blood everywhere, on the ceilings, all over the floor, all over his body, even on his hearing aid that was lying next to him on the floor, right by a pair of smashed eyeglasses. Lauren and Thomas called 911, and the university immediately went into lockdown. It was unreal. It just so happened that Thomas Minch was back in town, and there was another murder at Gallaudet. How? How does this happen again? Like the last time Gallaudet closed down, Cogswell Hall was completely evacuated again, moving students into now other available dorm rooms. They closed all the entrances to the school except for the main gate, which they were monitoring 24-7. They performed identity checks on all visitors 24 hours in advance. They had added security cameras everywhere. There was even an increased number of law enforcement officers on campus, so how does this happen? And the key cards that are used to get in the dorms, they had already been pre-programmed so that students can't use them 
to get into any other residence hall except for theirs. But before I tell you everything that happened, let me tell you about the quiet, studious young man named Benjamin Scott Varner. Ben was born on June 8, 1981, to his parents Willie and Diane Varner and his older sister Jennifer. They lived in Tacoma, Washington for the duration of Diane's pregnancy and the first year of Benjamin's life. From birth, Ben, like his friend Eric, was profoundly deaf. But unlike Eric, he still was able to hear very loud sounds. His mother, Diane, was an absolute super mom. She dedicated herself to being the most caring, present mother that she could and to encourage Ben to be independent and determined. When he was eight months old, she took him to get fitted for hearing aids. Diane's mission was to help Ben lead a fulfilling life and be able to communicate his needs the best he could. She wanted him to grow up and be able to do simple things like order at a restaurant or a convenience store and accomplish anything he set his mind to. Willie, Ben's dad, he was an army nurse, and in 1982, he asked for a transfer to Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio, Texas. And this was so that his son, Ben, could go to a school for deaf children. When Ben was only one year old, they moved, hoping to give him the best education possible. Ben eventually moved his way into hearing classes and enrolled in the Sunshine Cottage School for the Deaf, where he took part in speech and audio training as well as ASL classes. At 13 months old, Ben was a little terror he always tried to crawl everywhere. His mom said he crawled next to the stove while she was cleaning in the kitchen, and he pointed at the stove, and he said, hot. That was his first word. And she had so much joy. She was so proud of him. He had heard her the day before pointing to the stove and saying, hot, so he wouldn't touch it. All of her attempts to communicate and connect with her son using hearing aids and infant learning classes were working. He was one of those kids that teachers actually wrote those little notes about, saying he was such a pleasure to have in class, in the Texas school system, Ben actually had the option of sign language interpreter in the classroom. Ben was ambitious. Every day he would put in his hearing aids and he would strain to hear every conversation, to listen to everything his teacher said. And when he came home, he would be exhausted. Ben loved the hearing world, but it came with a price. And sometimes he pushed himself too hard. As he grew up, he went to Garner Middle School and MacArthur High School where he took Spanish, geography, religion, history, accounting, and science classes. Everything Ben did, he did for knowledge. He could give you facts off the top of his head. He knew all the rules for baseball, even though he wasn't actually interested in playing. He could tell you the difference between all the planets if you asked. And if you really wanted to connect with him, all you had to do was ask about his passion for traveling and learning about other cultures. Willie and Diane were in awe of their son's brilliance and his thirst for knowledge. He was super independent, just like Eric was, and he would often take steps to further his education without even asking them. And he would regularly go to events at the Islamic Center of San Antonio. One day, Willie gets this call from an Israeli consulate. The man on the phone told him that Ben had applied for an Israeli visa while he was still in high school, and this not only surprised Willie, but amused him, and he was more than willing to sign the paperwork. Toward the end of high school, Ben started to come out of his shell. He was now an uncle to his sister Jennifer's son. He had a group of students that he regularly tutored and a small group of close friends. His senior year, he took a school trip to Australia and it was all that he could talk about for months. Ben graduated in May of 2000 with almost a 4.0 and a generous scholarship to attend Gallaudet University. Ben loved Washington, D.C. It was a place where he could feel independent, meet up with international students and groups, and get involved in communities he wanted to be a part of. In the summer before college, he studied maps of the city and devoured books on Gallaudet history. Of course, he was nervous about leaving his family behind. He was particularly close to his mom. He didn't know how he was going to survive without being able to see her and talk to her every day. But he was also excited to start this new chapter in his life. Ben moved into the first floor of Cogswell Hall in August 2000, just like Eric Plunkett. Diane helped him move in. She remembers sitting together in their hotel room on the Gallaudet campus, reassuring him from the bed opposite of his that it was going to be all right. Trust me, you can do this, she said, and she was hugging him as tears were falling down his cheeks as she left. She could hear him crying when she was walking away down the hallway. She closed the door and then she cried to herself. And all of this makes me feel so awful for what they're about to find out. Ben did battle some homesickness, but eventually he slipped into the flow of his classes and bonding with Eric over the mutual love for travel. Ben's professors found him to be kind, inquisitive, and generous. He enrolled as an accounting major. He wrote emails to his parents every single day. In one of those messages to his mom, Ben said that he liked Gallaudet because it was super diverse and there was even a student from Guam on his floor. Then he emailed his mom again after Eric was murdered. He was terrified that he was going to be next, 
and he wanted to go home. He made it to the holidays, though. And he spent that winter break trying to figure out whether he wanted to even go back or not. Spring semester started, and despite Ben's anxiety, he thought the past might be in the past. But it wasn't. When Willie and Diane received the call that their son was dead, they were ripped apart with grief. They booked a flight the very next day, and Kathleen and Chris, Eric's parents, booked a flight as well because they wanted to be there for the Varners because they just lived through this entire gut-wrenching experience. They knew that his parents would have to go identify their son's body, answer questions from the police. It was a lot to take in. Eric's family also knew that Thomas Minch had been in town for his trial, and the coincidence was way too much. It had to be him, and the police needed to finally prove it. Enough is enough. Their kids are dying. A brand new detective was assigned to the case. Her name is Pamela Reed, and she's a homicide detective with a track record of solving cases. With a fresh crime scene now, her team knew exactly what they had to do. Investigators began interviewing students that they thought could be involved or have vital information. One thing seemed likely. The culprit had to have a Cogswell Hall key card. Investigators were on the scene right away. When I said it was worse than Eric's murder, Ben was stabbed to death multiple times, and it was obvious it was a vicious attack. He was barely recognizable. He had been stabbed 17 times in the back, the head, the neck, the chest, and even the eyes. Ben had cuts on his hands. He was trying to defend himself or pull the knife from his attacker's hand. He also sustained blunt force trauma. Just like in Eric's case, there were no signs of force entry, no murder weapon located in the room, but all the blood had to be processed and the room needed to be dusted for prints. Now, meanwhile, the police began all their questioning. When Lauren was questioned, she explained that Ben who had been moved to his new single room on the fourth floor after winter break, had been so scared for his life. He came to Lauren and he's like, I would feel safer if I was in a completely different building. He wanted out of Cogswell. Lauren did what she thought was right in that moment. She offered him support and reassurance of his safety. She told him he would be fine and that police were gonna find the person who killed Eric. But then Ben came to Lauren again. And he asked, please move me to a different residence hall. And again, she reassured him that nothing would happen to him. Till this day, Lauren is left feeling like she could have done more. If she would have just connected him with someone in charge of transferring rooms, then maybe he would still be alive. But what seemed to stand out was how overly concerned Ben was. And they wondered, was there a reason? Was this a natural fear of being in a dorm where his friend was murdered? Or was there more to it? Detective Reed went on to interview some of Ben's closest friends from the Wow Wow West group. First person she talked to was Joseph Mesa, and he said that he heard that Ben was gay, and that's when Detective Reed started feeling sick to her stomach. She wondered if Gallaudet really was suffering from a series of hate crimes. Had Clamati been wrong? Had Detective Simuidi been wrong? And had Eric and Ben's death been fueled by homophobic rage? And did that warrant being stabbed over 17 times? Get ready for this. The D.C. police sent several FBI agents to confront none other than their initial prime suspect, Mr. Thomas Minch, back in New Hampshire. When they interviewed him at his home, he acted like he couldn't believe there was another murder at Gallaudet. He told the agents he had a solid alibi. He wasn't at Gallaudet his entire trip. It was packed with other things, activities with him and his parents, which they had receipts for, like museum visits, restaurants. He couldn't have committed Ben's murder. He had willingly provided everything to them already, his fingerprints, his DNA. He said, do whatever it takes to clear my name. And his alibi proved to be true when they followed up on it. So it seemed like police were on the wrong trail. So at this point, Detective Reed decided to put aside some information from the previous investigations and start from scratch. She began with this new crime scene itself. From what they could see on the floor, the murderer had gone back and forth in and out of Ben's room the murder weapon wasn't there, and there was a trail of faint, bloody shoe prints and drops of blood going down the hallway. So they call in a shoe specialist, and they spray this coloring compound on the most apparent shoe prints that are made in blood. And when they do so, they can see an actual, like, full shoe print. And they were able to determine that it was a size 11 Nike Air Max tennis shoe. And that would rule out certain students on campus, right, if they didn't wear that size, they didn't have those kind of shoes. Detectives also surveyed the room. They collected forensic evidence from the blood patterns on the wall, for example, and they had this blood tested for DNA. They were hoping to find the perpetrator's DNA there. 
Then they searched surrounding trash cans and dumpsters, and that is when they found something. What they thought was the murder weapon, a bloody paring knife that belonged to Ben. His mother gave it to him. Why? Because he loved apples and he would use this to cut them while he was studying. He would have snacks. They also found a blood-covered jacket in the dumpster. During this interview process, very few students wanted to come forward with information about who might have killed Ben. They wondered what would happen if they spoke out. Would they be next? And at this point, the murders were all over the news. It had media attention from across the United States, especially since the FBI had now gotten involved. They were offering a $10,000 reward to solve this case. If anyone wanted to commit a crime, and there's a lot of sick people out there that do, they could easily have snuck into Gallaudet and blamed it on whoever committed the first crime. But whoever killed Ben might have also been Eric's killer. Students decided it was better to keep quiet or leave campus altogether. It's sad that people are so scared that they won't even give vital information. During interviews, Detective Reed discovered that the last time Ben saw anyone, it was February 1st. And then starting on the 2nd, Ben had not gone to any of his classes, he didn't meet up with his friends, and he didn't even go to a doctor's appointment he had that day. He never called his mom, and he didn't send any emails. So he must have been murdered the night of the 1st, which lined up perfectly with Thomas's trip to D.C. And then detectives found something else. Another lead. Ben's wallet was missing. His ATM card, his cash, his checkbook, they were all gone. And just like in Eric's case, someone had been using his money. On February 12th, the financial fraud team told Detective Reed that someone had actually cashed a check from Ben's account on February 2nd, a day after they think he was killed. Experts confirmed that the signature was not in Ben's handwriting, and the word laptop was written in the notes section. The check was made out for $650, and it had been cashed at Riggs Bank. So Detective Reed hops in her police car, drives to the bank, and asks them to pull up the security footage. And luckily, it still existed. And they see a man on the screen. But who is he? He looks a little older. He has some facial hair, but they can't really tell because it's not great footage. So she takes the footage back to the school, hoping that officials can make an identification. While investigators interviewed students and waited on forensic results, Ben Varner's family and his friends prepared for his funeral in San Antonio. The Plunkett family came there to support them through the service. Everyone wanted this killer to be caught. It doesn't take long for someone to make an identification of the man that cashed Ben's check. It was shockingly another friend in Eric's Wild Wild West group, Joseph Mesa Jr. The check was actually made out to him. The faculty confirms to detectives that Joseph is a Gallaudet student. The first thing Detective Reed wants to know is who is Joseph Mesa Jr.? When she looked into him, apparently she found that he was a local hero in Guam. He was a highly respected individual. He would tell the children in his town how great and big the world was and how it awaited them. His focus was on communicating with hard of hearing kids and teens about the opportunities outside their home country, such as going to Gallaudet University. Then she looks back at her files and she finds out that Joseph was the first person to report Eric missing. He also lived in Cogsball Hall up until recently, actually right across the hall from Eric, but she needs more evidence. She drove back to campus and had detectives Richmond and Murphy meet her in the office. She asked for Gallaudet to provide two interpreters so they could interview Joseph. He arrived with his girlfriend, Melanie, and entered the room alone, where they gave him waivers to sign. The detectives told Joseph that he had a right to a qualified interpreter, but he could also opt out and speak through two Gallaudet interpreters instead. He signed the waiver at 2.25 p.m., and they began a long conversation. It stemmed around how he was able to get his hands on one of Ben Varner's checks. Well, he had an explanation. It was pretty simple. He doesn't know what they're talking about. He says he never cashed a check, but they have CCTV footage, so they know he's lying. When they press him further, he says, okay, he's friends with Ben, and Ben gave him a check for computer parts. But then why wouldn't the signature match Ben? Something wasn't adding up. And the fact that he lied, that wasn't a good look. So the detectives tell him they want him to come back to headquarters and get fingerprints and give DNA. They also get a search warrant to process Joseph's room so they could find those sneakers. They thought maybe a shoe lover or even a broke college student wouldn't get rid of them, even if they had blood on the soles. But they had to let him go for now. On February 13th, Joseph was still lurking around campus. He denied to the detectives that he had any role in the killing. But that search warrant finally went through, and they searched his dorm. And inside, they found bloody clothing as well 
as a size 11 pair of Nike Air Max shoes. Yep. And there was blood on the soles. At the same time, DNA results went through. The perpetrator's blood on the crime scene matched with Joseph Mesa's. He killed Ben, and now he was going to get what was coming to him. Detective Reed headed back to the Department of Safety and Security. And when she got there, she found Joseph hand in hand with his girlfriend at the front desk. Melanie was crying and she was shaking her head. But Joseph, he was stoic. He signed to the secretary that he had a confession to make. Detective Reed asked Joseph what he wanted, and he asked to speak privately to both detectives with two interpreters. In the interview, Joseph said, quote, to be honest with you, I did it, end quote. He explained with a completely empty expression that was cold as ice that he had been in the process of moving to Krug Hall, but he still had all of his belongings at Cogswell. And while he was in the middle of moving from one dorm to the other, he signed in with the RA, got in a moving dolly, and gone to Cogswell Hall, where he eventually knocked on Ben's door. Ben, thinking that they're friends, let his killer inside. Then Joseph began to inquire about whether Ben had a checkbook. Ben said he did, but he wanted to know why Joseph wanted to know. That is when Joseph said he spotted a four-inch paring knife under Ben's microwave, and he grabbed it, and he used it to stab him in the right side of his neck and cheek. Ben tried to flee from him in a state of shock, pain, and fear, but Joseph blocked his path. As the two men were wrestling on the floor, Joseph admitted that he put his arm around Ben's throat and stabbed him in the face and eyes, leaving the knife embedded inside one of them until later. He also said he cut his throat and kicked him several times in the head. After murdering Ben, Joseph went to his dresser drawers and found his checkbook. And once he did, he was on his way, leaving behind Ben's lifeless body in a pool of blood. He didn't even attempt to clean anything up or worry about the trail of blood. When he was inside, he actually stole one of Ben's t-shirts to put on top of his own bloody clothing. Then he pulled the knife from Ben's wound and he went to the dumpster where he threw the jacket and the murder weapon inside. At that point, they took him to the police station to videotape the rest of this interview, and I have some of that footage, so I'm gonna be showing it on the screen while I'm talking about it. His girlfriend was still by his side after all of this, and then he proceeded to give a three and a half hour confession without requesting a court-appointed interpreter. He used two from the school. He explained his desire for Ben's money, how he thought that Ben would be an easy victim because he was such a quiet person, and he actually started the rumor about Ben being gay. But the thing is, it's like he wanted the police to know everything that drove him to kill Ben. He found joy in it. The investigators asked him why he continued to stab Ben so violently, and according to him, he knew Ben was going to report him to the RA, so he stabbed him in the neck again and again because he felt he had no choice. Poor Ben was fighting for his life. He was struggling to breathe, and Joseph said that he felt more and more guilty because he saw him suffering, so he was relieved when he finally died. That's sick. That's actually sick. Joseph Mesa Jr.'s confession was cold, very matter-of-fact, and emotionless. During the interview, the investigators showed Joseph the picture of the jacket and the knife from the dumpster, and he confirmed that the coat was his and the knife belonged to Ben, and it was the murder weapon. When Joseph left Ben's room, that wasn't the last time. He went back three or four more times to check and make sure he was dead, but it was more than that. It was about looking at what he had done, almost admiring it. He told detectives that at one point, he stared at Ben's body for more than 20 minutes. That is frightening. And he didn't actually take the checkbook until the last time he came to check on, or I should say gaze upon Ben's lifeless body. And instead of getting rid of the t-shirt he took from Ben's closet, he kept it as a souvenir of sorts. It was just hanging with his other clothes in his closet. After spilling every detail of Ben's gruesome murder, for two hours, investigators were toward the end of the confession when they asked him if there was anything else he wanted to say. And that's when Joseph said, quote, Eric Plunkett, I also did that one, end quote. During the second confession, Joseph admitted he needed money. And he thought that Eric was alone because he lived in a single room. And he knew that Eric was weak because of his cerebral palsy. So he targeted him. He went over how he was going to kill him for days and days. He said Eric was sitting in his computer with his door open at the time. Once inside, Joseph walked up behind Eric. He put his arm around his neck in a chokehold 
and he held it there continuously until Eric stopped breathing. Then he told him that he laid him down on the floor and kicked him again and again, and then he decided to use the chair. He confessed to beating in Eric's face and head with that chair, and then he proceeded to pick up one of the chairs in this interview room to show them exactly how it was held by him. Don't think that was necessary. He left Eric lying dead, and then he placed his credit cards in his pocket. But Joseph wasn't finished with his chilling confession just yet. As Eric was lying dead on the floor of his dorm room, Joseph sat at his computer chair and used Eric's credit card to buy a bike for himself and one for his girlfriend. Then he claimed that he falsely placed Thomas Minch in their crosshairs and tried to divert the investigation away from him. Later, when he needed more money after winter break, he turned to Ben Varner. He figured if he got away with it once, why wouldn't he do it again? And that's cold. On February 14, 2001, Joseph was in prison immediately after this confession, and he was held without bond. The head of the D.C. police, Charles Ramsey, said that robbery was the motive behind both murders. They concluded that his cold expression during his entire confession indicated there wasn't rage behind these killings. He was just a sick individual. He did it because he thought he could get away with it. That night, Kathleen, Chris, Willie, Diane, and Craig, and Lois received calls from the police reporting Joseph's arrest. Kathleen remembers feeling hollow and horrified because she had met Joseph in person at the candlelight vigil. He'd hugged her. He'd given her condolences and told her how much of an honor it had been to be Eric's math tutor. He had also gone out of his way to send back some of Eric's things to his mother, movies and clothes he had apparently borrowed during their alleged friendship. He even included a note saying that he was friends with Eric and had borrowed them and wanted to give them back. It takes a horrible, remorseless person to face a grieving mother after premeditating her child's murder and say how sorry you are that he was dead. I can't even imagine being in Kathleen's shoes and having to face that truth that her son's killer had been there all along. Students and staff at Gallaudet University were stunned when they heard the news. The two murders weren't committed by some crazed serial killer or even a transient that was living on the crime-ridden streets of Washington, D.C. No, the killer was one of their own, a close friend, a deaf student, someone they saw as a brother. Once Joseph was detained, police also contacted Thomas Minch in New Hampshire, and they told him he was dismissed from any suspicion, and he was allowed to return to Gallaudet if he wanted to. Thomas broke down. He looked at his mom and he signed that it was done. He was cleared, but he never wanted to go back to Gallaudet ever again. Thomas later said in an interview that he wanted Eric's family to know that he would never have hurt Eric, that Eric and Ben were wonderful, sweet people, and he valued their friendships. Even though Thomas wasn't guilty, his life was changed forever. He said in an interview later that he couldn't understand what he did to deserve to be falsely accused of two brutal murders. He lost his ability to attend the university he dreamed of. And in a lot of respects, Thomas was another victim of this crime. He said he felt like his hopes and his dreams had been shattered, that he lost everything. In the months after Joseph was put behind bars, more information came to light about his criminal history, plus much more. Joseph was born as a profoundly deaf person in a hearing family in Guam. Growing up, Joseph raised roosters so they could fight each other and was into football and wrestling, but he grew up frustrated, depressed, and isolated, partially due to being deaf and unable to communicate with others. In high school, he left home for a secondary school for the deaf, and this was a school that was on the Gallaudet campus, and he loved it. He liked to brag about how rich he was, and he would give money away to people. In the high school seniors class yearbook, Islander Joe, as they called him, was nominated as most likely to be rich in the future, but actually, he was more likely to go to prison based on his long history of misconduct. In 1995, he was threatened with expulsion if he kept stealing. His sophomore roommate, Stephen, had watched him steal $45 in cash from someone's room just walking in. In April of 1999, when Joseph was in his first year at Gallaudet, he stole his roommate Devin's ATM card and took out $3,000. The university reported this to the police department and suspended Joseph from the school for one year. On one condition, though, that he reimbursed Devin for the $3,000. Joseph went back to Guam. In the summer of the year 2000, Joseph re-enrolled in Gallaudet and prepared to repeat his freshman year. 
Staff members had actually recommended that Joseph be expelled permanently from the campus, or at least not be invited back into the dorms. But he had made amends, and he promised he wouldn't do this to any more students. So they gave him another chance. Before he left, his father, Joseph Sr., told him, stop stealing for good. Joseph promised that he was going to be a better person, but that promise was empty. After that, he murdered Eric, the friendly, outgoing student who lived directly across from him. He used his computer to log in and make multiple purchases and send bikes back home to his family. Then he bought supplies at Union Station, using up all of Eric's limited savings. And then he stole again from Ben. Joseph was never going to try to be better. He lasted maybe a month before he fell back into his old ways. But there was more. A psychological analysis was conducted and during one of those sessions. Joseph admitted he used to kill innocent animals. He even demonstrated to the psychiatrist. He showed how he would stuff kittens into a bag and stomp on their heads with his feet. And this doctor that evaluated him said that he had a twinkle in his eye when he was explaining this. And he didn't think Joseph killed these two men for money. He thought that that was just something extra, that Joseph did it because there was pleasure that he got out of it. In his opinion, Joseph was on his way to becoming a serial killer. And there were signs. He fit the profile. Now that Joseph was in prison, people started to think about why it took so long to figure this out. The case was so public, but so convoluted. People started to question the D.C. Police Department's investigative process. When Detective Simioidi first interviewed Joseph in September, nobody even ran a background check on his criminal history. They didn't ask him why he said he smelled something coming from Eric's room when the rest of the people in the residence hall didn't smell a thing. I'm sure at least one of you wondered why someone would say they smelled something when it hadn't even been a day. I ignorantly assumed that perhaps deaf individuals might have stronger senses when one of them is suppressed. I don't know, but that wasn't it. He just wanted a reason to be suspicious about Eric's locked door. Secondly, the police were so focused on Thomas being the culprit, they neglected to do a complete inventory of Eric's belongings. They didn't realize what was missing or dig deeper into the debit card transactions. They postponed the background check on Eric's computer. In fact, the police only reported to Gallaudet University that Eric's cards had been stolen after Ben's murder. They didn't even know that Eric's wallet was missing at the time of his murder. That's why Gallaudet hadn't told them about Joseph's history, because nobody had informed them that theft was a part of the homicide at all. From the university's perspective, it appeared to be a hate crime. A retired detective of the D.C. Police Department, Jeffrey Green, gave his opinion on the initial investigation. He said that, quote, if reasonable and professional techniques had been used during Eric's investigation, then Detective Simioidi would have realized sooner that Joseph had been the one to steal Eric's money. If he had done more investigation into who bought those bikes on Eric's computer, such as maybe figuring out the mailing addresses where the bikes had been sent to, he might have tracked Joseph down. And that was the end of his statement. I guess this shows how easily our biases can get in the way of our rational thinking. Detective Simioidi was so focused on Thomas Minch. He missed key details. The negligence in Eric's case not only caused the wrong person to be implicated, but also contributed to the circumstances surrounding Ben's murder. So Thomas ended up suing the police department for wrongful arrest, and he declined Gallaudet's invitation to come back. The university did offer a public apology, and the judge ruled that Thomas's lawsuit would be covered once Joseph was implicated. Later, the District of Columbia actually won the lawsuit. It's true that Thomas had been affected emotionally, but he also withheld information. He was partially responsible for the circumstances of his interview. My advice is if you are ever questioned about your involvement in a crime, Please get a lawyer. Investigators are not on your side. Ben Varner's family also sued both Gallaudet and the District of Columbia for negligence in December of 2001. And they had a lot of reasons for this. If Joseph had been expelled from the school, Ben and Eric may never been in harm's way. If the school had tried harder with their security procedures after Eric's death, Ben might not have been murdered. And if Eric's case had been fully investigated, Joseph might have been implicated before he had a chance to hurt anyone else. This lawsuit was also valid and clearly came from a place of grief and outrage. Ben's death could have been prevented, and the judge agreed with them. But ultimately, the case was dismissed. There wasn't enough evidence that Gallaudet didn't do their best to make sure the school was secure. The judge also ruled that though the initial investigation was not thorough, police officers cannot be held accountable for harm that criminals do. 
There just wasn't enough evidence of negligence to fire anyone in the police department. The rest of 2001 was a hard year for the Gallaudet community. Students, faculty, and families were relieved and heartbroken. It was a scary thought that someone from their own community had done this. And it is scary that you could invite anyone into your room, even who you think is your best friend, and they can turn on you and no one can hear you scream. For a long time afterward, the university was still cautious with who they let in and out of the university grounds. Student IDs were checked regularly and every car that visited had its license plate recorded. However, time went on and Joseph stayed behind bars until his trial on May 3rd, 2002. All the family members flew to attend the trial, including the Mesa family, who still love their son, despite everything. The head prosecutor, Jeb Bosberg, accused Joseph of two counts of premeditated murder motivated by money. He argued that Joseph would kill again and again to get what he wanted. Joseph testified that he was not mentally well when he killed Ben and Eric. He said that he was haunted by hallucinations of two hands covered in black leather gloves that belonged to the professional wrestler, The Undertaker. He said that when the hands did something in front of him, such as steal money or kill a person, he would follow that impulse and copy what they did. I swear, I have heard it all. But I mean, the defendant does have a right to present their version of events. Joseph had two interpreters that were signing everything in front of the jury. At one point, he said that the hands were telling him to kill the prosecutor. But the prosecutor used this information to prove that Joseph had control over his actions. He's like, oh, you're thinking about attacking me? But you're able to control yourself? And that's when Joseph said, not yet, but I plan to kill you eventually. Well, that's a reason to keep him locked up right there. In his defense, his attorney said that he was suffering from intermittent explosive disorder. And I don't know about you, but I've never heard of this before in my life. But I always learn something new in these cases. And apparently, it's when you have an overwhelming rage and you get a feeling of relief when you act upon it. It sounds like something a toddler would suffer from. The thing is, during the time he was in prison, he sent a bunch of letters to his girlfriend, Melanie. And in those letters, he talked about how he was going to convince the jury that he was insane. He told her, if we made up stories, it would confuse everything. And then I can plead temporary insanity. Does anyone think it's scary that his girlfriend was still in contact with him? What's really interesting about this is that not a lot of studies have been done on whether or not you can tell if a deaf person is suffering from insanity. There's no way to test that they're in their right mind like you would of a person that is hearing. And I got this from what I read online. There was a doctor that talked all about this. I'm going to end with this. Joseph's girlfriend was actually one of his witnesses. And she told the jury that they were actually married and that since she was his wife, she couldn't really testify against him. She had a wedding ring, their marriage certificate. But guess what? She was registered as single on her driver's license. And they found out that she made the certificate on the computer after Joseph was arrested. That was just another con that they put together so that they could lie and argue that they had marital privilege. But the motivation for the final verdict was when the prosecutor showed that three and a half hour confession to the jury. He never mentioned any black hands in his mind guiding him to kill. No. Instead, he calmly and rationally told them every detail. So on May 22nd, the jury decided that Joseph was mentally stable and that he premeditated the murder, burglary, and robbery of Eric and Ben. The jury later said that if he had spoken about this undertaker's hands in the videotaped confession, they might have had a different verdict. Wow. But they could tell Joseph was definitely faking it. Joseph tried and failed to appeal his sentence. He tried to use a law called the Interpreters for Hearing Impaired and Non-English Speaking Persons Act of 1987. He wanted to say that the police violated his rights by assigning him Gallaudet interpreters. However, we know he waived his rights. On July 10th, he was given six life sentences for the murders and another 90 years for the robberies without any parole. In the 20 years since this happened at Gallaudet, the fear of something so horrific happening to students, especially those who cannot hear their intruders and defend themselves, is still present. Cogswell Hall will never again be used as a residence hall. I wanted to honor Eric and Ben for the ambitious, loving people that they were. I also think it's important to talk about how the deaf community was rocked by this case. I'm so sorry to Eric and Ben's families and their long fight for justice that they had to endure. 
And I thank all of you for being here to listen to their stories. I will see you in my next video. Bye.